Hi everyone, thank you for watching this. Gustave Flaubert's debut novel Madame Bovary, published in 1856, landed the French author in court on charges of obscenity. He won the case, but the publicity made the novel a best-selling sensation. It took Flaubert five years to write Madame Bovary, and today it's considered one of the best novels in the French language. Dozens of films and TV dramas are based on this story, and almost everyone has heard of it. So in this video, I'll summarize Madame Bovary, tell you about its major themes and a few points of analysis, and answer the question, how fiction impacts reality. I will also show you the genius of Flaubert's precise language and beautiful description by giving some example passages from the novel. In the end, I'll compare it to Tolstoy's masterpiece, Anna Karenina, which I discussed a few weeks ago. Summary The novel begins in a school in a provincial town in the north of France. Flaubert originally titled the novel Madame Bovary Provincial Manners. So the setting plays a major role in the novel. Unlike Balzac, who set most of his novels in an urban setting like Paris, Flaubert wanted to show the other side of France, the up and coming provinces. What is unusual about the novel is that the first we do not meet Emma Bovary, the protagonist of the novel. Instead, Flaubert introduces us to her future husband, Charles Bovary. One reason for this unusual way to start a novel is that perhaps Flaubert was self-conscious of the fact that he was basing his novel on a real story of a woman, Delphine Delamere. He had read a newspaper whose life basically aligned itself with the plot of Madame Bovary. Another reason is that Flaubert uses Charles to frame the story, as he appears strong at the beginning as a weak boy, then at the end as a broken man. The middle, which is the bulk of the novel, centers on Emma's adventures and mishaps. So Charles is like a mirror through which we can see, understand and even judge Emma. Okay, we're in school. We meet Charles, a very timid boy who is bullied by his classmates. So that's our Chekhovian gun. If he's an awkward boy, he's bound to grow up to be an awkward man. Anyhow, he grows up to become a low-level doctor. Doctor is a bit of a stretch, he's a health officer, which means he is not a real doctor, but we are in the provinces, which means he acts like a doctor. You know he's not a real doctor, because his mother forces him to marry a rich, older widow. Charles is not the kind of man who says no to people, so he's married and sets up a small clinic and life is fine. Then one day, attending a patient on a farm, in the middle of the night, Charles meets the most beautiful girl he has ever seen. Here we meet Emma, the protagonist of the novel, the most famous Bovary in the world. Despite it being in the middle of the night, it is love at first sight for Charles. So he finds every excuses to visit Emma's family. Like a love-stricken plumber who pokes holes in every pipe in the house so he can visit his love. Emma is educated and has read a lot of books. Hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? The way Flaubert describes her education, it seems it's like a bad thing because she read a lot of trashy romance novels. So Flaubert has to marry Emma to Charles for the novel to work and for us to find out Emma's reaction to marriage and romance in the real world. She knows so much about romance inside the pages of novels that what is like in real life. Oh boy, she is in for a shock of her life. Just like Don Quixote, she is delusional. But hang on a second, Charles is already married to a rich widow. I'm afraid it's time to kill the old lady. That is life. But the problem is that you can't just kill someone for no reason. We have to find a good excuse to get rid of her so Emma can move in. Flaubert doesn't do murder mystery. Instead, he finds another way to kill her. She dies. Why? Well, we learn that the widow tricked Charles's old mother like a peacock. The widow is not as rich as she claimed to be. The news breaks that she duped Charles by pretending to have a lot of money, which she didn't. The widow is so humiliated that it actually kills her. Flaubert kills her character softly. Her death is also our Chekhovian gun here. Lack of money, humiliation and death. Remember that. Now, Charles is free, but the provincial manners dictate that he waits a while before making a move on Emma. Charles asks Emma's father for his daughter. He's an alcoholic man who agrees. Emma, however, has no say in the matter. Of course, we are in the 19th century, a time when most people had very few rights or choices in life. You might sympathize with Emma here. She doesn't even know if she loves Charles. Here, her head is full of idealized love and she has read in romance novels. Quote, 
Love, she thought, must come suddenly with great outbursts and lightning. A hurricane of disguise which falls upon life, revolutionizes it, roots up the will like a leaf, and sweeps the whole heart into the abyss. Charles has no idea what's going on inside Emma's head. He's only seen her beautiful body. They're saying that men fall in love with their eyes, but women fall in love with their ears. In this case, Emma has read a lot of fantastic romantic tales, so everything is in her imagination. Charles and Emma marry. The whole of France celebrates. I'm kidding. That's what Emma had imagined, but it's a provincial wedding, so it's very low-key. Life is okay, but Emma's waiting for all the beautiful things to happen to her. Quote, at the bottom of her heart, however, she was waiting for something to happen. Like shipwrecked sailors, she turned despairing eyes upon the solitude of her life, seeking afar off some white sail in the mists of the horizon. She did not know what this chance would be, what wind would bring it to her, towards what shore it would drive her, if it would be a shallop or a three-decker laden with the anguish or full of bliss to the portholes. But each morning, as she awoke, she hoped it would come that day. She listened to every sound, sprang up with a start, and wondered that it did not come. Then at sunset, always more saddened, she longed for the morrow. Oh dear. Emma realizes that this is not what she expected of marriage. She imagined unicorns, fantastic balls, knights in shiny armor. But she's stuck in this tiny town with boring doctor who always smells disinfectant. But maybe Charles is an interesting person to talk to. Flaubert says no, quote, Charles's conversation was commonplace as a street pavement, and everyone's idea trooped through it in their everyday garb, without exciting emotion, laughter, or thought. He had never had the curiosity, he said, while he lived at Drouon, to go to the theater to see the actor from Paris. He could neither swim, nor fence, nor shoot, and one day he could not explain some term of horsemanship to her that she had come across in a novel. A man on the contrary, should he not know everything, excel in manifold activities, initiate you into the energies of passion, the refinements of life, all mysteries? But this one taught nothing, knew nothing, wished nothing. He thought her happy, and she resented this easy calm, this serene heaviness, the very happiness she gave him. Oh dear, Charles has no idea, but credit to him, he notices that Emma is not happy. So he decides to move his clinic to a bigger town, Yonville. Perhaps bigger city might make Emma happier. Here we meet Homi, an arrogant pharmacist who does everything to destroy Charles's business. Flaubert introduces Homi to depict the new business class who chase money in some ruthless manners. His moral value is solely based on making money at whatever cost. Inside the house, however, we have good news. Emma gives birth to a baby girl, Bertha. Surely the smell of baby will overpower the smell of disinfectant and heal Emma's disappointment. But instead of helping, the baby makes things even worse. The smell of poop, all night crying, and the baby can't even talk or walk, and to make matters worse, it's only a girl. Emma wanted a boy. Is that an allegory for a man? Emma wanted a man, who knows? Emma wants adventures, thrills, excitement in life, but she's stuck at home. Quote, but it was above all the meal times that were unbearable to her. In this small room on the ground floor with its smoking stove, its creaking door, the walls that sweated, the damn flags, all the bitterness in her life seemed served up on her plate. And with the smoke of boiled beef, there rose from her secret soul whiffs of sickliness. She has had enough. It's time to break rules. She meets Leon, a young law student, much like Gustave Flaubert himself. Leon loves books and literature, so does Emma. They hit it off like a lion and a lioness. But at the crucial moment, Emma is scared, so she backs off. Leon, disappointed, moves to Paris to study law and become a lawyer. I wonder who's better partner, doctor or lawyer? Doctors alleviate your pain and lawyers empty your pockets, so they are equally useful. After this little experience with Leon, Emma thinks that was exciting, so she does it again. But she needs a good excuse, wishing Charles could give her a good reason, like beat her or shout at her. But you know Charles, he's a nice man. Quote, Even his gentleness pushed her to rebellion. Domestic mediocrity drove her to sumptuous fantasies. Marital caresses to adulterous desires. She would have liked Charles to beat her, so that she might, with some justice, detest him and take her revenge. But Emma doesn't wait for Charles to give her a good excuse. This time with a more experienced man, Rodolphe, a wealthy local man who knows how to play the game in seducing Emma. Emma gives in very quickly and they have an affair. Then another one, and more, for four years. Charles is totally oblivious to the whole thing. He continues to love Emma the same and goes about his job like he is the king of the castle and has the best queen in the world. 
Emma, however, psychologically exhausted from hiding the affair from Charles, and suggests to Rudolf they run away, to live freely in some other parts of France, somewhere nobody knows them. She's so naive. They set a time and place to meet and run away. Rudolf doesn't show up. Why? He likes things the way they are. Also, I don't think he loves Emma that much. So why risk everything to live in hiding from everyone? But now the relationship is over. Emma is so devastated that she turns to Jesus for a while. She becomes a devout Christian. Only for a while though. Everything with Emma is only for a while. I think we can relate to her. She's only human. Quote, in her enthusiasms, she had always looked for something tangible. She had always loved church for its flowers, music for its romantic words, literature for its power to stay the passion, and she rebelled before the mysteries of faith just as she grew ever more restive under discipline, which was antipathetic to her nature. But as time passes, she recovers from it all. At least she's safe because Charles has no idea what she has done. One day Charles takes her to an opera, a romance. Emma's passion for romance is rekindled. Idiot Charles. Now she wants excitement and romance again. But wait a minute, she also sees a young man at the theatre. Is that the law student Leon from Paris? Now he's an older and much more experienced and the affair begins very quickly. Emma has done it before. I'm sure Leon has had sex in Paris. They meet at a hotel regularly, the same place, the same room, many times. Again, time, the bloody time, changes everything. After a while, Leon is bored of Emma. Why? Emma is getting old. It's tougher for women. Your look can take you places no man can ever go, but unfortunately looks fade. I think Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time has a bit of similarity with Madame Bovary as to how time is slowly killing us without us realizing sometimes. We only realize it when we notice how others see us. In this case, Emma understood that she was getting old because she saw herself and how Leon saw her. Quote, Everything, even herself, was now unbearable to her. She wished that taking wing like a bird, she could fly somewhere, far away, to regions of purity, and there grow young again. It's an incredibly realistic depiction of how passion evaporates over time. So much so that the French prosecutors claim the novel's realistic depiction of life was dangerous to the morality of the French society. The prosecutors argued that Madame Bovary was a terrible influence on young people, especially women. Back then, the French government was terrified of people, especially after many revolutionaries marching up and down the street. And it was only men, so liberating women too? No, 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 madame. That would have been too much to handle. Luckily, the judges didn't agree with the prosecutors, and today we have one of the greatest modern tragedies in world literature. With the realization that her looks are fading away, Emma starts shopping to make her look better which is also an alternative form of therapy to have excitement going in her life. She is judged by her looks, so shopping is a natural progression. Capitalism also caters to women more than men. You might have noticed when you go to a shopping mall, men's sections are pretty tiny compared to women's. Emma loves buying luxury goods. She has a credit card, so whatever she wants, she buys. Well, not a credit card, but she buys with credit. She gets heavy in debt. Desperate to find money to pay back, everyone says no, including Leon and Rudolf, the two men she slept with so many times. Her husband, however, Charles, has no idea. What an imbecile. Emma runs away from the bay leaves and credit card companies and finds herself in a cul-de-sac and there's no way out. She thinks she has only one option, suicide. She takes arsenic. Our modern tragedy runs its course. Just like Charles's first wife who died after the revelation that she had no money, so humiliated that she died. Emma too ran out of money and didn't want to face the humiliation, so she took a more proactive step. However you might judge Emma, you have to respect her as a protagonist. She is fantastic as she makes things happen. She takes risks, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. She had an amazing many hours with her lovers. So she lived fast and died young. But it is the impact of her actions on those around her that makes it a tragedy. After Emma's suicide, Charles is devastated. He sells everything he owns to pay off Emma's debt. But he has no idea what happened. Once the house gets emptier and emptier to pay off the debt, Charles discovers all the love letter exchange between Emma and her lovers. Charles sits down and reads them. Just like Flaubert killed Charles's first wife, he does it again. It is too much for Charles, a man who dedicated his life to make Emma and their daughter happy, now has nothing. His life has been a lie. First it was grief after Emma's death, but now the revelation, it's simply too much. Charles dies of grief and disappointment. The French provincial tragedy is over. The novel ends with the last of the money left in the family so their child, Bertha, can be sent to her grandma, Charles's mother, the older Madame Bovary. 
poor child. Her mother never loved her, and now both parents are dead. Home is pharmacy where Emma gets the arsenic and runs the town without a rival. He's like a ruthless pharmaceutical company today who concocts all sorts of things to make money and destroy his rivals. So the true villain in this novel is capitalism and the superficialities that it promotes. Like chasing money and chasing happiness. Like you deserve it all. If you're not rich or happy, you're a loser. Emma's pursuit of happiness destroyed her life, her husband's life, and ruined her child's life. Now I'll discuss some of the themes of the novel. Fantasy versus reality. The first thing you notice about Madame Bovary is the danger of reading too many romantic tales, especially when you're young and impressionable. Today the debate is on the influence of rap music or video games on violence. 150 years ago the same issue was with young people, especially women, reading cheap romances. Emma is easily influenced by romantic tales to a point that is almost ridiculous. I think Flaubert caricatured Emma a bit here. He wanted to make a point by exaggerating how cheap romance or tablet newspapers or just general mass media was making everyone stupid, and ruthlessly selfish to pursue money in the case of Homi, the pharmacist, or happiness in the case of Emma. These romance novels and newspaper were promoting a kind of superficial, materialistic, and self-indulgent pursuits among people. Charles Bovary's rival, Homi, the chemist in town, reads his newspaper and schemes against the naive Charles. Flaubert knew that this bourgeois class was on the rise and everything was becoming more superficial and materialistic. Instead of reading good literature, they consumed tales that gave in to people's wild fantasies. In fact, Flaubert himself read a newspaper article about a woman who had done exactly as Emma, had cheated on her husband, had got into heavy debt and committed suicide by taking arsenic. Not only Emma read these wild romantic tales, but she also expected reality to conform to those romantic and adventurous she had read in books, just like Don Quixote. You could say that with such a fertile imagination, Emma should have been a fiction writer, but Flaubert says no. Quote, she wanted to get some personal profit out of things, and she rejected as useless all that did not contribute to the immediate desires of her heart, being of a temperament more sentimental than artistic, looking for emotions, not landscapes. Emma's hedonistic approach is somewhat similar to a lot of people today who are great consumers, people who shop to make themselves feel better. The story resonates with today's world, that millions of people, apparently mostly women, are heavily in credit card debt due to their shopping habits. Flaubert wanted to show the superficiality of provincial life in the 19th century, but 200 years later we have the same materialistic and consumerist madness going on. What makes this story resonate with us is how realistic it is even in today's world, where superficiality has become mainstream. The one difference between Bovary's time and today is that women no longer need men to provide security and provisioning. If Emma lived today, she would be free. She would have to work for years to pay off her debt. But in those days, women heavily relied on men to look after them. So if you were to write a similar story today, nobody would read. Because it's no longer taboo when a woman goes on her sexual adventures. Writing. Flaubert was a master with his word choices, sentences, and cinematic writing. One of my favorite scenes is when Emma and Rudolf watch the agricultural fair through the window from inside an empty town hall. For the first time, Rudolf confesses his love to Emma. Rudolf's confession and the speech by the local prefect are told simultaneously to create this cinematic moment as though the camera is panning from the couple to the fair. This goes back and forth to contrast the monotonous formal speech with a romantic confession. Flaubert creates an awesome moment in literature, the mundane contrasted with the romantic. This is also a perfect juxtaposition between dream and reality. Emma is in her dream at that moment, while most people at the fair worry about tax and the price of their harvest. Flaubert deployed this juxtaposition technique in all his novels. He would contrast a couple murmuring and whispering beautiful romantic words with a demonstration on the street where thousands of people are shouting and marching. The French loved to demonstrate. After drinking coffee, going on strike is the second most popular hobby in France. I'm joking of course, I absolutely love France and its culture and literature. Flaubert's language is incredibly precise, his description is beautiful, poetic, and always to the point. Here is an example of Flaubert's mastery of precise language. Quote, a gust of wind that blew and the window ruffled the cloth on the table. And in the square below, all the great caps of the peasant women were uplifted by it, like the wings of white butterflies fluttering. No wonder he spent five years writing this novel. Balzac, on the other hand, wrote a novel a month. Maybe not a month, but he was a fast writer. Flaubert is also a master of creating imagery that is poetic and profoundly beautiful, in which he combines the physical elements with the emotional. Here's an example. 
But she, her life was cold as a garret whose dormer window looks on the north, and ennui, the silent spider, was weaving its web in the darkness in every corner of her heart. Madame Bovary vs. Anna Karenina A while back I reviewed Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina. While reading both novels, you immediately notice a few similarities. Both novels have female protagonists, Emma and Anna, who cheat on their husbands while their husbands are faithful and oblivious. Both heroines become obsessive, which lead them to commit suicide at the end. You could say that Tolstoy copied the plot from Madame Bovary, which was published some 20 years before Anna Karenina came out. But that would be too simplistic. Though both are extremely realistic portrayals of life in France and Russia, they are very different works. Tolstoy's Anna Karenina is much grander in its scope, as it chronicles three sets of places St. Petersburg, very urban and modern, Moscow, very aristocratic and slightly older, and the countryside, where life is much slower and simpler. Madame Bovary is less ambitious in its geographical scope, as it deals with the bourgeois culture, away from the chaos of Paris. Anna Karenina's beauty is in its vastness, with many characters, while Madame Bovary's beauty is in its compactness and sharp focus. The one unifying theme in both novels is how modernity changed the way people saw their roles and duties in society. The change was especially important for women who wanted more freedom from their traditional roles as wives and mothers. In both novels, the female protagonists want to escape their marriages, husbands and roles. Emma doesn't like to be a mother, but Anna loves her son. Both husbands are simple, boring men who take their jobs and duties very seriously and continue to love their wives. Jude and Peterson might argue that women are chaos. Without chaos in their lives, they search to find one somewhere else. If they can't, they create chaos themselves. These two novels seem to suggest that both Anna and Emma married boring men, reliable but not exciting. So they searched for some excitement somewhere else. Today that message has been instilled in every one of us. Don't wait for happiness, chase it. Don't be content with what you have, always shoot for the best. So I don't blame Emma, I'm much like her. On a subconscious level, we all chase chaos. We are programmed to deal with adversities, chaos and thrills. We used to live in trees for millions of years, then chased by lions in the savannah for millions of years. These days, life is a little too comfortable, so we all look for some thrills. Be it in Disneyland or in real life. Thank you for watching.